I would like to thank uh, the Parramatta Diocese of Catholic Education for inviting me to speak today. And I also will start by acknowledging the original owners of this land and paying my respects to uh, elders past and present and to any Aboriginal people here today. I don't do that lightly. I can't redress the wrongs of the past, but as, uh, as a, a moral human being, I can do something about the present. And as a teacher, I like to do something about the future. I think we're all on the same page there. I've had a very long career. It's spanned more than 50 years. Greg was being kind when he said that we would known each other for about two decades. We've known each other a little bit longer. Uh, my work over that career has largely been with disadvantaged communities. And for the latter part of my career, with young refugees and asylum seekers. And the focus of my talk today will be on that work and the ways in which a human rights perspective can inform school practice to benefit disadvantaged students in general. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the focus, of course, will be on refugees and asylum seekers because that issue has not gone away uh, and won't. You will have noticed the ambiguity of the title of this talk. That's quite deliberate, both for teachers working with disadvantaged communities and for disadvantaged people themselves. I have seen refugee families fall apart under the strain of their new life in Australia. Safe from persecution at last, but not from the electricity bill or the, or the trauma that comes back when people have settled their lives a little bit more, when the immediate danger has gone, then a lot of the past comes back and floods people. And I've also seen schools walk away from students because they're in the too hard basket. This person's over 17, why should we enrol them? Uh, that's not part of my, uh, that's not part of my uh, statement of duties. Um, uh, school holidays are about to start, so uh, I'm not going to, uh, I've got to go down the south coast. Well, that's not much good this year, is it? Schools play a critical part in the settlement of new communities in Australia and in building a better life for less privileged people in the community in general. They do this both through expanding the educational opportunity uh, for their students and building the civic values and cohesion that are major contributors to what sometimes is called the civil society, a term I have to say that is often loosely appropriated by politicians to serve their own purposes. Education is both an individual and a social good. However, as you will know as teachers, positive outcomes don't necessarily flow automatically from the provision of educational services. And this is where equity comes in. We have to make that good happen. What do we mean by equity? Well, equity often gets bundled up with other terms like human rights, social justice, equality, etc., etc., And in that, in that bundling together, uh, the distinctions between them can get blurred. And I thought I might just explore those distinctions to start with. Human rights are the overarching principles that inform a just society. And as overarching principles, human rights are often aspirational, but they can be enacted in law such as in anti-discrimination legislation or in compulsory schooling in this country. Equity is an, an, it is an enabling principle. Those actions or processes which remove the barriers to equality of access to rights such as education or health care or voting. Look, it's what's happening in some of the, in parts of the United States at the moment to prevent uh, black people from uh, access to their right as citizens to vote. Equality is not about being the same as everybody else, but having the same rights and having the same access to those rights, no matter who you are. Equality under the law is a basic principle of democracy. Social justice is the outcome of the application of those principles. It is the fairness quotient, if you like. Now, this talks largely about equity, 
about what we as educators can do to ensure every child in our care gets the best deal possible. And it's about social justice, how equity can improve those children's lives in the long term, and by doing so, improve society as a whole. It's about fairness. Significant government funding has been allocated to, ec to, to education over the last 50 years, as we know, to achieve more equitable outcomes. Well, that's some of the rationale. The hard re reality is, however, that despite this expenditure, we still do not have an equitable education system. This is as true within systems as between them. Elite and selective schools are at the top of the hierarchy in any system, and schools that serve low socioeconomic status communities at the bottom. Many low SES schools are public schools, although many Catholic schools serve similar communities, particularly in outer metropolitan and regional areas. The experience and outcomes of education are quite different for young people of different social classes, Aboriginal students, the disabled, the mentally ill, refugees and asylum seekers, and students in re rural and remote areas. Level f the level playing field is tilted towards the metropolitan and the advantaged, not the disadvantaged and powerless, and increasingly so. This has a lifelong impact. Australia is now one of the most inequitable countries in the OECD, to our shame, I have to say. Children are by definition powerless. However, the education they receive is a major factor in their relative power as adults. That is what the various iterations of disadvantaged school funding have recognised over the past 50 years, and the Gonski and the Bradley reforms have sought to address more recently. Bradley, of course, the, uh, tertiary, the tertiary view, review that also looked at what happened to feed in to tertiary education. That's where it's of great interest to us as school teachers. As teachers, we really do need to be aware of these issues, and we need to frame our thinking about our teaching in the context of human rights to ensure that every student gets a fair go. The relativities in education won't go away of their own accord any more for example, than the world refugee crisis will go away, augmented as it will be in the near future by climate change refugees, something in the Herald about that yesterday. The latest UNHCR figures, which are for 2018, state that there are now 70.8 million forcibly displaced persons in the world. 70.8 million people, three times the population of this country, essentially. Uh, of whom, of whom 41.3 million are displaced internally in the countries uh, where they came from. There are 25.9 million refugees, people outside their country of origin. More than 50% of those people are children. And there are 3.5 million active asylum seekers. The current displacement rate is 37,000 people a day. That is, one person every two seconds. In the time that you're here today, just think that almost 37,000 people will have lost all their rights and their homes. Resettlement is a remote possibility for most of these people. In 2018, for example, only 92,400 refugees in the world were resettled permanently. Very few of the children forcibly displaced have any chance ever of gaining an education. Uh, the small numbers of refugee children uh, who are permitted into Australia are the lucky ones because they have to attend school. Uh, there, there were in 2018-2019, uh, the Australian government works on a, on a, a financial year, not a calendar year, uh, something like 6,845 children came into Australia as refugees. Uh, that is 40% that is, uh, of the 17,112 people who got refugee and special humanitarian visas in that time. So 40.1% 40, 40 of all the people who came as refugees to our country in that year's space were children. A fundamental human right is the right to an education. 
Long before anyone started talking about human rights per se, the founding fathers, and I use that term judiciously because there weren't any founding mothers of Australian Federation, had introduced legislation to make school education compulsory for all children. If we would have a nation, they reasoned, then people, both men and women, needed to be literate so that they could vote responsibly and take on civic duties and offices. In other words, so they could participate in an informed way in the life of the nation. Aboriginal Australians were not included in any of this, the consequences of which we continue to see today in low school completion rates, just over 50% in 2018, generally poor academic outcomes and low participation in higher education. Of course, basic literacy and numeracy alone are not uh, sufficient in themselves for participation in today's society. Australia is culturally very diverse, but people from minority cultural groups, our bishop uh, excluded, are underrepresented in civic life, as are Aboriginal Australians. And there's that widening equity gap reflected in our academic outcomes. Think about this and think about what academic outcomes mean and who gets the best bits of it, of, of those outcomes. Think NAPLAN, think HSC, think the feeding frenzy every year at HSC time, and think of the kids who get that, those, those very, very high marks and what sort of privileged education most of those have had to get there. Uh, think post-school destinations, think school completion rates, uh, think who gets to be the leaders in adult life, in politics, business, tertiary institutions, and the public service. And then you've got a picture of, of what that, that gap is doing to the whole of our lives, not just to children at school. The current school completion rates of 85% sounds impressive when you compare it to the meagre 15% when I finished school. But completion rates vary enormously from state to state and are aligned with factors such as socioeconomic status, lack of suitable education and training alternatives, where you live, aboriginality, whether you speak a language other than English at home, and whether that language is a high or, or low status language as well. Uh, and if you're an asylum seeker turning 18, I thought I'd explore that one with you in a moment. Students who fail to complete school generally have higher rates of long-term unemployment and are more likely to find themselves in low-paying or casual jobs in what we now call the gig economy. And of course, these are the jobs least likely to survive structural change. Low educational attainment and low expectations on the part of students themselves, their parents, and sadly, often their teachers, and our society play a major role in students not completing school or not completing it well enough. You know, a few years ago on SBS there was a program called Struggle Street uh, about the community, um, in part, part of the community in Western Sydney. And I, I thought when I watched that program that the young people who bared their souls to us in that program had gained nothing whatsoever from all those years of compulsory education. It had been completely useless to them. They ended up without having achieved anything very much. And so their descent into, um, into uh, dependency, uh, social security dependency and drug addiction was probably inevitable. What a sad indictment of our system. Uh, there's evidence uh, as well that this low educational attainment and low expectations have a compounding effect within disadvantaged communities. And that was something that I, as a teacher, and as a principal, set out to actually take on and challenge, that you can have a very low SES community and you can do something about it. The extension of a school leaving age to 17 years has not markedly improved the situation at all in relation to disadvantaged young people. And the increase in school retention rates marks a lack of opportunity for employment and training for young people at the bottom of the pile. I'm not telling you anything I think you don't already know. I'm just putting it into words. I mentioned asylum seekers turning 18. <laughs> Government policy is to cease support for young asylum seeker refugees when they turn 18, on the grounds that they are now adults and can support themselves. 
there is not a similar policy for local students who turn 18. It was this policy that led to my establishing the Friends of Zainab Trust in a school accounts in 2002 to support Zainab Kabi, a year 12 asylum seeker student who was then on a temporary protection visa so that she could finish the HSC. Because she had turned 18, she was no longer eligible for government support. Then, then called the special benefit, now called the SRSS, or Status Resolution Support Service Payment. It's about 80% of New Start, or 80%, and that's not very much, as you all know. That hasn't, that hasn't improved in the last 25 years. What you may not be aware of is that in, in last year, the government terminated the payment of the SRSS for the majority of asylum seekers in the community. And that has led to widespread financial stress and hardship at a time when people are also dealing with the, with the uh, uncertainty of their immigration status, the trauma from the past, the fact that they can't access uh, most services in the community which are available uh, to migrants. Friends of Zainab, I have to say, was funded, my, my, my little fund uh, was, was funded by donations to the school. Uh, Zainab completed her HSC, she got some university offers, uh, but because asylum seeker students are classified as international students, uh, she was obliged to pay full international student fees. Trick. Uh, asylum seekers are not eligible for HEX. Indeed, no one on a temporary visa is eligible for HEX. No one. And students on permanent visas, that's people who are permanent residents of this country, who are not humanitarian entrants, are not eligible for HEX help. So they have to pay their fees up front. You probably didn't know that, but it's the sort of information that you as particularly high school teachers need to have, because this is one of the big barriers to a lot of low SES immigrant families sending their children to university. They can't afford upfront payment of HEX. This, this impacts most heavily on these students. And these are the people that you, most, you, or might, you might argue are the people most in need of the benefit of higher education and who have struggled more than any others to get to the point of actually getting a university offer. This group of students includes many from refugee backgrounds who are not counted as refugees young people on family reunion visas, orphaned relative visas. That's, that's the sort of thing that I'm talking about. I negotiated a full scholarship uh, for Zainab at her university, and we provided her with a, a, fortnightly allow, a fortnightly allowance equivalent to the special benefit while she was studying. She completed her degree with a distinction average. Goodness gracious. How could we be knocking back people like that from further education? And then she went on to study pharmacy at the University of Sydney after gaining permanent protection. Because she had a permanent protection visa, in Australia, an onshore visa, she was not considered a humanitarian entrant. So she had to pay her hex up front. So Friends of Zainab paid her fees, of course, enabling her to complete her first degree and uh, undertake the second one. I raised enough funds not only to support Zainab, but to support other Holroyd refugee and asylum seeker students, and there were lots of them. This help was absolutely essential in a school where approximately 60% of all students were from refugee backgrounds. In 2015, for example, uh, a lot of those were asylum seekers at one point. We had 75 asylum seeker kids at Holroyd High School enrolled. There were approximately 700 asylum seeker children in New South Wales public schools at that point. We had slightly over 10% of all those kids. Friends of Zainab migrated to the Public Education Foundation uh, a bit before I retired, providing and now provides scholarships for literally hundreds of students around Australia uh, in the last two years of high school and the first two years of university. Financial support is essential for refugee students completing their schooling and entering higher education particularly. Uh, I'm sure I don't need to tell you that all refugees are poor. <laughs> However, financial support is critically important to asylum seeker students because not only do they have no money, but they are subject to restrictive and discriminatory policies designed to prevent them from continuing their education 
and we had to fight even to have them allowed to stay at school until they completed the HSC. Forcing young people out of school when they turn 18 has been a persistent government policy, tried on by successive immigration ministers when they thought they could get away with it. It's resulted in a lot of these young people having to leave school before completion of year 12. For young people who've lost everything, a credential like the HSC is, is an essential starting point for rebuilding their lives. And that's important when schools are considering the enrolment of older students. Uh, post-compulsory post students. I enrolled a lot of older students, up to 24 years of age in fact, because school was the best place for them to be uh, and, and to get that HSC. School's a small scale. You know your students. You have the capacity to develop, to, to deliver individualised academic programs and individualised welfare programs, but knowing the students is really important. They can get lost in, in a TAFE college, can I say. Uh, I'd emphasise that there's no one-size-fits-all uh, way of dealing with the needs of disadvantaged, of, uh, disadvantaged students of any kind. Schools need to explore what works best for their, their students. In 2012, I made a formal complaint to the Human Rights Commission about 18-year-olds being forced to leave school once again, and then I raised the issue at the inquiry, which was held the following year, into into children in detention, the one that caused Gillian Triggs to be pilloried by the government. This led to negative publicity for the government and admission by then Minister Morrison that the Commonwealth could not determine school policy on enrolment. And that's something everyone who is a teacher needs to know. Enrolment is a matter for individual schools and systems. Principals may enrol asylum seeker students after they turn 18. The challenge then, of course, becomes financial support for that student. The situation is different again for students who have had their visas revoked, and that's something the government has been doing increasingly over the last uh, couple of years. These are people who have permanent protection or permanent residence who have their visas revoked because the government decides that maybe they didn't dot all the I's and cross all the T's on their original application. In, in public schools, that leads immediately to the revocation of something called the authority to enrol, which is a requirement for the enrolment for all students on temporary visas in public schools. Catholic schools, I note, are not bound by si similar rules. In some jurisdictions, no students on temporary visas may enrol in public schools. This is the case in Western Australia. We found out about that when a former asylum seeker student of ours, Fahim, uh, who has cerebral palsy, moved to WA. I made another complaint to the Human Rights Commission. You get more savvy the longer you go along in this game, uh, on Fahim's account. And eventually we negotiated uh, as a school with the CEO in Western Australia to enrol Fahim in a Catholic school so he could go to school. In 2017, the government enacted new laws to prevent young asylum seekers who were evacuated from Nauru for medical reasons from continuing their education in any setting after they turn 18. That still stands. Uh, this legislation, of course, predates the, um, uh, the Medivac uh, uh, legislation, which is likely, of course, to be thrown out of Parliament this year. What a dreadful thing that is, too. I've come to the conclusion, after more than 20 years fighting this extraordinary punishment of young people over something as basic as their education, that the government has a, dis a deliberate intent to deprive young people uh, in this category of access to education, in breach of the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the Human Rights of Children and Young People Affected. I decided the only document that was really relevant to me as a principal was the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, when I told that to the Department of Education, I was a bit stunned, but uh, they recovered in the end. Scholarships, scholarships are, are, are vital to support young asylum seekers finish school and get that HSC. Uh, getting an HSC should not be the end of the story. We now recognise that all young people need to continue their education after they finish school and that low educational attainment can lead to deleterious life outcomes. I'm raising these issues with you today because I believe schools are in a unique position to advocate on behalf of the young people in their care and can make a real difference through that advocacy. 
I see it as an extension of our role as teachers, not above and beyond. It's part of our moral purpose, if you like, maybe a little along the lines of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's idea of responsible action. In the last three years that I was at Holroyd, I initiated negotiations with a number of New South Wales universities to provide full scholarships for asylum seeker students, as more were becoming able to complete their, their HSC with reasonable ATARs. I did this initially just for Holroyd kids, uh, as our long-term policies for retention and academic success were coming to fruition in an increase in successful HSE completion and an increase in university offers. Uh, in fact, in the last three years that I was principal of Holroyd, uh, an average of about 60% of our HSC class had first round university offers. This in a school uh, population where 65% of all students were in the bottom Ixia quartile and 84% in the two bottom quartiles. You will know that the, uh, that the range, that the, the rate of university take up for people in that bottom half of the Ixia quartile is much, is much less than 60%. I extended my lobbying to other schools and in 2017 convinced the department to take over the university entry program as I decided to retire. I didn't want the program to lapse because it made such a difference to the lives of those young asylum seekers enabled to attend university. Refugee and asylum seeker students and a lot of disadvantaged kids do Manage to, who manage to get university entry do so against the odds. All young refugees have had massive interruptions to their education. Many have had no education at all. The sheer difficulty, think of this, of having to learn English, maybe having to learn to write in another script, sometimes having to learn to read and write from the beginning and having to catch up on missed learning has meant that many of these students have not reached university entry standard by the time they complete year 12. In addition, of course, not all students who do get there have been given the best advice by their schools in terms of the most appropriate subject choices, which has meant lower ATARs than might otherwise have been. A few years ago, I was approached by a young man who'd been at another high school. He had an ATAR of, this is the year after his HSC, an ATAR of 53, uh, approximately, uh, but he had got that on only six units. His other units, his other four units were non-examinable subjects and he had been counselled into that by the school. Had he, had he done 10 ATAR worthy units of study for his HSC, he would have had a university offer and one of those universities that was by then on side with me, on board for giving scholarships, would have given him a scholarship. I estimated he would have had an ATAR in the 70s and that was quite enough to get in under special, under special considerations. But the school there had done, they were, it was not, it was not meant badly, it was well-meaning, but it was the wrong advice. We need to keep those options open for people whose potential we don't know. But if you looked at, if I looked at the graph of value-added improvement for my kids, it went up in a line like that. It didn't, it, it didn't go like that. It was going like that because as their English got better, their literacy got better, their confidence in themselves got better, all of that worked. Um, and so I, I spoke in 2015 at a national conference in Geelong uh, of, of people who are equity officers in university about, about this sort of thing that I was doing. And I'm happy to say that since then, a whole network around Australia of equity people interested in refugee and asylum seeker support have, has been set up and nearly every Australian university has come on board with support. And again, if you are a high school teacher, you need to know about that. UTS, for example, has 16 asylum seeker scholarships, full scholarships every year now. You need to go online to those universities and check out what's available because that's important if you have those students. There's a, a lot more available than there was. It's important now that we put pressure on TAFE actually to provide full vocational training opportunities for young people who, don't, who are not seeking a tertiary pathway. What can we do about it? Well, at the school level, what I decided in the end was that I'd remove all the barriers for success for all my students, everything. This meant physical and material support, things like 
school uniforms, shoes, funding of excursions, stationery, health care. We employed a refugee nurse, dental care, breakfast program, uh, access to organisations like STARTS, the Service for the Treatment and Rehabilitation of, of, of Torture and Trauma Survivors, a really critically important Western Sydney organisation. Access to technology, a lot of our kids don't have that. It also meant highly focused uh, educational support, EAL, EAL support in all years 7 to 12, literacy support where it was needed, and that's different from remediation. We need to remember that, that people who come illiterate to Australia are not necessarily uh, suffering from any um, uh, delayed development, that they, they actually need very specific literacy support to get them up to speed because it's all being done in a really short time frame. Our 16-year-olds who arrive illiterate want to be walking out that door at 18 with their age cohort. They don't want to be hanging around. They've got, they've got a life to make up. Tutorial support for HSC students. Homework centre, because a lot of our, our poorer kids don't have anywhere that they can do their homework quietly. A provision of a full academic curriculum, the whole thing, right through, if you can, to extension maths and things of that kind. You need to give those options for people. We can't dumb down the curriculum because people are disadvantaged or poor. Appropriate subject counselling, a wide range of options, particularly at senior high school, and the employment of additional professional and non-teaching staff to deliver these programs. I'd always sooner have a teacher than a whiteboard, I have to say. It meant engagement with university outreach and mentoring programs and with similar things run by business and arts communities. These sorts of programs are important in shifting the expectations and aspirations of disadvantaged students. As Bradley noted, to improve access to, edu to tertiary education for disadvantaged students, three precursors are necessary. Awareness of higher education, aspiration to participate, and educational attainment to allow participation. We made sure all three precursors were in place in Holroyd. It's nothing that can't be done for any of these groups of people. And it meant scholarships to provide the financial support and constant advocacy both for individual students and in principle. I have to say, for some groups in our society, unfortunately, social justice remains elusive. And while it it does so, engagement and participation in society will be too, and the energy and motivation to achieve a better life simply won't be there. It's my belief that schools need to provide the leg up uh, in life that more privileged students have from their families and networks. We are their families and we are their networks, uh, and so we need to be in there doing the things that might have been done. How do you advocate for your students? Well. You have to be informed about immigration and visa issues. I, I have a great list of visa types which I consult. I was working for a student that I don't know uh, just the other day uh, to, to get them enrolled again into, into to get, to get a an exemption from payment of um, temporary visa fees uh, for, for a, a high school in Sydney. So schools need to write letters of support for their students. They need to be able to go to tribunal hearings if they're there. You need to be able to go to court with your kids if they're called to court. You need to provide informed counselling to students with complex psycho psychological issues derived from traumatic experience. Um, you need to know which community agencies uh, you, can, you can access and you need always to have to reach out a human hand and support to people because that's so important. When we're talking about equity, we're talking about human rights. So I'm, I'm just going to jump a couple of things because I have to say, first of all, a lot of the girls who came to us uh, had very low, low literacy. 70% of all the illiterates in the world are female. Um, there, are 120, there are 130 million children estimated who never attend school around the world. I think that that's probably a low estimate, um, but 70% are girls. Uh, and so. Uh, so two thirds, two thirds of the world's illiterate are female. A lot of the refugee girls who came to Holroyd had had 
little or no prior formal education. It was a school that made the life difference to them. And it was not only, it was not only the education that made a difference, you know, some of those girls got off the plane, they're coming from parts of Africa or from Afghanistan, they almost doubled their life expectancy the moment they got off the plane because for the first time they had proper access to health care, they had access to um, better food, they had access to a lot of the things which shorten people's lives. And of course the girls later on will have access to gynaecological support which makes a huge difference. I'll just talk to you about one of those refugee girls. And that is, that is the lovely Sakaina, Sakaina, who came to visit me recently when I was in hospital for appendicitis, would you believe, at my age anyway. Um, Sakaina uh, is a, a nurse. She's currently on maternity leave with her second child. Uh, she, she nurses at Concord Hospital. She came, I went to her graduation at UTS a few years ago. She was the first person in her family to go to school. No one had ever been to school. Not a father, not a mother. No one had ever been to school. Takena came, and of course, she was 13. She couldn't read or write because she was an Afghan girl, and girls don't go to school there, for, from her class anyway. She is the first person in her family to graduate from university, but she won't be the last because she has university firmly on her agenda for her two children. So when children from illiterate backgrounds and from desperately impoverished backgrounds go on this educational journey, you know, they take the entire family with them. Their, their lives are transformed and the lives of their families are transformed. It is, it is a permanent thing. Whatever you do to you, I say this to them, whatever they do to you, they cannot take that credential away from you. They cannot take your education away from you. It is, it is the most important thing that you have there, that and your humanity. Now, Sakaina is specialising in midwifery and she's considering studying medicine, though she might have to wait uh, a little bit, uh, I think, with the, the two children. She, she and her mother, her mother insisted on coming uh, to the hospital and the baby came to the hospital and we sat and we talked. What a privilege for me to know Sakaina. And there's Hawa, her dear friend. Hawa came out of East Africa. She was, uh, she's Sudanese, she came uh, through, she was in Kokoma, she grew up in Kokoma refugee camp, which is one of the horror, the hills of East Africa. She couldn't read or write, but after only three years of formal schooling, that is one year in the intensive English centre at Holroyd and year 11 and year 12, the, the end part of year 10 and year 11 and year 12, she scraped into university. She had to learn English, she had to learn to read and write, she had to learn how to hold a pen. She got into university and she has now finished a social work degree and she's talking about studying law because what she wants to be able to do is to help other people. I have all of these transformational stories behind me. Baria, who I was looking at on LinkedIn the other day, uh, his family lived on a bridging visa for seven years with a six-week turnaround time. Every six weeks, his father had to go cap in hand to get an extension of the visa. The family never knew when they would be tossed out of the country, and at one stage, they almost were. I argued for, I argued for the family to stay in Australia. I argued for Baria's right to go on to university when he finished the HSC, having argued for his right to complete the HSC after he turned 18. And I then argued with Western Sydney University and they gave a scholarship to Barrier. He graduated with an honours degree in engineering, civil engineering. He's now a highly successful civil engineer involved in the construction of the Metro uh, through Western Sydney. Uh, his brother, Okbar, is also a civil engineer and blessings his sister Samaya has become an English high school teacher. And she teaches high school English at a school in Melbourne. And for an old English teacher, I have to say, having someone become an English teacher is pretty good. Now, we, can, we can make a difference as teachers to these young people. We can take young people on that journey. It changes their lives, but it changes us too. I've been enormously privileged to be on that journey with them. And uh, 
I, I'm, I have to finish. Unfortunately, I could go on for hours on the things that we do, and I'm sure you would be bored if you would probably need your cup of coffee. But what we did, what we did, we, we rebuilt trust in those children. We rebuilt optimism for the future, hope for the future. Uh, we did this through our teaching by our recognition of the human dignity of each and every one of those children and their families where they had them. We made life normal again for children whose lives had been completely disrupted. And they learned to be a bit optimistic about the future by success in school. Through succeeding in school and becoming normal, they learned to shift their lives. And what happened with their parents who often are condemned to much narrower lives. The it was a powerful message for their parents, you know, because it meant that they too could look to the future. And if you've been through really traumatic experiences, it's very hard to look to the future. But if your children are starting to shine, then you can. And that's why rights are important, because we should respect them and apply them in everyday life. And that's why it's so important being a teacher. I've never regretted becoming a teacher. Thank you.